Good afternoon and welcome to Tor Vergata University here in Rome, Italy. My name is Bianca Maria Raganelli, professor of public law and economics at uh, Tor Vergata University, Department of Management and Law, and director of the Jean Monnet module program on European Union Innovative and Sustainable Law. Just a few words about the program. Uh, it aims at promoting the European integration studies in different fields, stimulating the research and the debate in crucial areas such as public procurement, financial supervision, innovation, artificial intelligence and public decisions. The program is divided into different modules of analysis and discussion, converging into two educational modules. One is offered in Italian in April and May, while the second one is offered in English in November and December. The second module, European Union Innovative and Sustainable Strategy, include academic uh, lectures, in-depth seminars with experts and workshops. The methodology is based on an interdisciplinary approach, legal, economic, business, and involve the participation as speakers of academics, researchers, scholars, international experts and professionals, representatives of institutions and of the private sector. Today, the seminar Innovation and Sustainability Transitions is organized with the participation of the Sapiens Network and I will soon leave the floor to Professor Apolloni, who will tell us something more about this network. Our speakers today will be Valentina Bianchini and Aura Irascu. Valentina is a young Marie Curie researcher in our university here in Tor Vergata. Her research fields are mainly public procurement, circular economy and anti-corruption. Aura is a PhD candidate in administrative law at Asselt University in Belgium and an early stage researcher Sapiens Network. Her research focuses mainly on public contracts, circular economy and sustainability. Thank you for accepting my invitation to present some results of your research that I hope will feed the debate today at the end of the seminar. So my name is Andrea Polloni. Let me share the thanks a lot to, Bian to Professor Bianca Maria Raganelli. I don't know if you can see the PPT. Yes, we can. Yes, okay. also here. Okay, thank you. So just a few words to introduce the Sapiens Network, the um, sustainability and procurement uh, at international, European and the national system. The main goal of this project is to contribute to the up, uh, uptake of the um, sustainable public procurement using sustainable public procurement as a tool to address the social and green challenges. And we have 10 uh, academic partners and 19 leading researchers. In the academic partners, we have uh, University of Hasselt, University of Torino, University of Birmingham, Corvinus University in Budapest, University of um, Greenwich, University of Tor Vergata, and um, Uch um, University. Uh, this is a picture of our uh, 15 early stage researcher from uh, um, one, uh, the, the, the meeting from which if I remember well. And this is the 19 partnering organization uh, located in, um, in Europe and outside Europe. So the, uh, the main goal to the Sapiens Network, uh, absolutely the Sapiens Network is to disseminate, you know, how research. And we are doing uh, several advanced training course available online. And um, we have a lot of secondment that can support us to doing the research. Publication are in open access. And I hope you can join our dissemination on LinkedIn, Twitter, Sapiens uh, website, Sapiens newsletter, and uh, sustainable, uh, sustainable procurement law course. 
So thanks a lot to, again to Bianca Maria Reganelli, to um, Valentina and Aura to, to make uh, this uh, interesting seminar. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, we can leave now the floor to Valentina for the first um, presentation. Actually, first uh, is Aura's, so I will yeah. ask uh, Aura to, to start. Thank you. Thank you, Aura. It's fine. Perfect. I'll just share my screen. One second. OK, uh, can you see my screen in full screen? Yes. OK, perfect. No, so no, sorry. Uh, yeah, yes, now we can see it because okay. here probably we are a little bit uh, slower in the connection. So just give us a few more that's, seconds, that's okay. but it's fine now. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So good afternoon, everyone. And thanks both, both Professor for uh, this kind of introduction and also for the collaboration. Um, my name is Aura Irashko. I'm a PhD researcher and also an early stage researcher in the Sapiens Network. And uh, today my presentation uh, will focus on a more uh, legal perspective when we talk about innovation and sustainability. And in particular, I will focus on the use of public procurement as a leverage for the circular economy. So as you can see, my current research is on procurement and circular economy. It's, let's say, a bit of a continuation of uh, my early studies in law and legal practice. Um, and as Professor Bianca Maria Raganelli uh, kindly mentioned previously, so I'll just jump into the agenda of today. So uh, today, my presentation is divided into two main blocks. The first part will explore and delve into the notion of circular economy with a uh, more legal uh, perspective, as well as the main indicators for uh, monitoring progress towards a circular economy. Afterwards, in the second part, we will shift uh, to public procurement and how a public procurement can use the circular economy and vice versa. And finally, I will give you some uh, of the best practices that can be applied and as well a um, um, short case study. So I would like to begin this webinar with the global context, um, showing the alarming phenomena that are uh, occurring on our planet, uh, to understand why are we here today talking about this. And among today's global challenges, we find climate change, biodiversity loss, deforestation, scarcity of resources, all things that we could avoid by simply respecting the planetary boundaries. Uh, these pictures here are showing how the nine planetary boundaries that you see divided into small little segments are being overshot throughout time, especially in 2023. And today, the recent research of September 2023 um, uh, actually highlighted uh, that there are six out of the nine um, boundaries that are being overshot. So how do we read this map? Well, the planetary boundaries is a concept that sets limits, limits within uh, which the humanity can continue to develop and thrive for the generations to come. As you can see, uh, the situation has worsened in the last 15 years and it has worsened drastically. Uh, now, if we zoom uh, into 2023, we can see that some of these boundaries have been crossed to a very large extent and we need to take action from different sectors and within interdisciplinary actions in order to reverse it. So the green zone is the safe space uh, below the boundary. Then we have the uh, yellow to red that represents the zone of increasing risk. Then the purple indicates uh, and highlight uh, the risks, the high risks for the Earth system and that the conditions are uh, highly transgressed. Crossing the boundaries increases the risk for of generating large scale and abrupt or irreversible environmental changes. So as I said, boundaries are also interrelated processes which means that uh, a global focus on climate change would not be enough. We need to have an overall and interdisciplinary um, approach to this. So we know that the world population is increasing 
and that economies are relying progressively on more resources so that uh, the production and consumption is excessive compared to the planetary boundaries that we just saw. Our economy is very linear and is worsening the overshot of these boundaries. But what do we mean by a linear economy? Well, when we talk about a linear economy, we talk about actually an economy where the raw materials are being taken from the soil, are used to create consumer goods. Then after being used, they, are, they become waste. They are most of the time uh, disposed of into landfills. But conversely, a, a circular economy, which is actually the main topic of today's discussion, is a system in which, I will give you later the main definition, but is a system in which uh, the, we maintain the value of the products for as long as possible and try to generate, generate as minimum waste as possible. So this means that in this system, we will try to focus on uh, activities that um, that are, um, for example, the recycling, the repairing, remanufacturing, and as you can see from this beautiful image that I uh, that I took from uh, Circular Flanders on the right, in a linear economy, the trash bin is full of waste, while a circular economy aims to the opposite. So I think it's very interesting just to understand the 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 difference between the two. So today we will merge these concepts with uh, public procurement. Uh, which is a process by, uh, by which the contracting authorities buy work, products and services from the private companies. And this means that public authorities can choose environmentally friendly goods in order to boost circular economy and innovation. Um, just what is going to change if we do so? Well, I will show you some data based on recent studies. Um, actually of 2023, if we, if a circular economy was implemented, virgin material extraction could drop by around 30%. Greenhouse gases emissions could be reduced enough to limit the global temperature rise up to two degrees. And the current overshot of planetary boundaries could be reversed at least in six, in five out of uh, these six cases. Of course, this would not be enough as we could see all these global changes require um, comprehensive and inter interdisciplinary action, as, as I said uh, previously. So we will build upon the first concept of circular economy that I just mentioned to get to a more comprehensive understanding of a circular economy. And I will start with its evolution. Of course, um, a circular living approach is not new to mankind, it's not something of 2023. The fact that it's now a trending concept, it doesn't mean that it has never been uh, used before. In fact, we have traces of it, of this kind of living throughout several eras, from uh, the Indonesian traditions to the Minoan uh, European traditions. However, from um, an academic perspective, the first academic that has mentioned the circular economy explicitly uh, was in, uh, Leontief in 1928 in his PhD work. And after this, uh, different school of thoughts have uh, focused on the concept that on concepts that can be easily related to the circular economy, which are cradle to cradle, uh, performance economy, biomimicry, industrial ecology, regenerative design and the blue economy. But from 2010 onwards, and we will see it also at the European level, it became a trending concept and um, big NGOs, as for example, the Elaine MacArthur Foundation that already provided also a definition of the concept, has focused on this. And the academic debate has in increased to such a point that today is considered almost an independent research field. So if we look at it from a legal perspective and to how can we trace the concept into the various uh, political and legislative approaches, we see that we can find three different clusters. We can have explicit uh, laws that are labeled as circular economy laws, for example, in Japan, China, or uh, recently in, um, in France. Secondly, we have laws that underpin the principles of a circular economy. For example, this is very easy and common to find at the European level, for example, in the Waste Framework Directive. 
And finally, we have laws that are impacting on the circular economy. And an example of this could be the Ecodesign uh, Directive. So the European Union considers that a circular economy is necessary in order to decouple economic growth from resource extraction, to develop our European capacity of critical raw materials and, and avoid disruption in the supply chain. And the circular economy can also accelerate a regenerative growth model and ensure economic expansion, job creation and the social inclusion. And in this next slide, I will show you just some numbers on the results that have been achieved so far. And these numbers are taken from Eurostat and concerns the years from 2012 to 2014. And as you can see, the transition to a circular economy has increased investments, has added extra jobs. We talk about 4 million jobs, circular economy related, of course, and uh, stimulated innovation through also private investments. So moving on from still from the European perspective, we can see that um, the European Union had had a um, roadmap towards circularity, which is quite long and dense. And here I just put some of the measures that are hard or soft law, and those are linked to the circular economy. Worthy of mention here are the circular economy action plan. We see the first one, the, the big uh, uh, SEAP written, um, circular economy action plan number one and the two, 2015 and 2020. Uh, those plans have impacted many legis sectoral legislation. The first one particularly impacted the Waste Framework Directive, while the second one, its impact is much higher. It impacts also public procurement, as well as um, because it has already anticipated in 2020 uh, the adoption of sectoral minimum environmental uh, criteria and recently uh, adopted in uh, legislation in enforcing such uh, trajectory on batteries, the direct uh, the, uh, regulation on batteries. So on this roadmap, it's also interesting to envision other legislation or legislative acts that are part of our today's discussion. And first I refer to the public procurement directive package. So the, all the legislation on public procurement comes from this, from 2014. Then we have um, a communication, the public procurement for a circular economy of 2017. And finally, in 2020, um, the European Union uh, adopted a regulation, uh, so the so-called taxonomy, that has provided us with the first uh, legal definition on, on the concept of circular economy. So before getting into the definition itself, I would like also to mention that the only legal uh, to date, the only legal definition, OK, is only part of the European taxonomy. But what is the taxonomy? Why do we find our definition in this regulation? Well, the taxonomy is an European legislative act that creates an European wide classification system for sustainable activities. So by doing so, the taxonomy helps to steer all the investments towards the economic activities that are in line with the European objectives, which are aiming to transform the European economy into a more greener, resilient and, uh, and circular system. So the European taxonomy allows financial and non-financial companies to share a common definition uh, of economic activities that can be considered environmentally sustainable. Uh, by doing so, they ensure that the single market is not distorted by different interpretation of the same concepts among the member states. So if we read the European taxonomy, we find this definition at Article 2, number 9, which states that the circular economy is an uh, economic system whereby the value of products, materials and other resources 
in the economy is maintained for as long as possible, enhancing their efficient use in production and consumption, thereby reducing environmental impact of their use, minimizing waste and the re uh, release of hazardous substances at all stages of their life cycle, including to the through the application of the waste hierarchy. So I have here highlighted the main uh, points of this definition, even though out there in the academia, there are more than 200 definitions circulating, but this is the only legal one, the, the only one that we are provided with and that we can work from a legal perspective. So um, let's say the main uh, elements of a circular economy are here put to the forefront. And first, we have the maintenance of the value of products, materials, and other resources. And how do we do it? Through the enhancement of their efficient use by reducing environmental impact, and finally, through the minimization of waste. So, as said before, the taxonomy sets a common definition for sustainable activities, including for those that are focusing on the circular economy. And when we look at it through the eyes of public procurement, we can make that for the connection. In fact, this could be of help for the procurers, for the contracting authorities, in order to understand and identify those economic operators, meaning those companies, that can provide circular businesses, circular economic business, or how they can contribute in a substantial way to the transition to a circular economy. So uh, the taxonomy sets out um, four core elements to identify an uh, economic activity as being sustainable, and in our case, as being circular. And those are explained with the four bubbles around uh, the, the main circle. So first we have um, in order for an activity to be substantially um, uh, considered sustainable uh, and sustainable moving towards a circular economy, this um, uh, activity has to contribute substantially to the circular economy transition. And in Article 13 of the same regulation, we um, have a list which explains better what do we mean by that. But on the other hand, this is not enough. The same activity cannot significantly harm the circular economy at the same time. And this is explained in Article 17 and with indication that I will uh, provide you shortly. Next, it is also necessary to be compliant with the technical screening criteria. Those are, let's say, a sort of standards. This is left also to future delegated acts. Uh, we don't have those yet, but it's going to be much easier for authorities to understand uh, based on those criteria if they are um, circular activities or not. And finally, what is also important is that they have to be compliant with the minimum safeguards. Uh, and by this, we mean uh, compliance, for example, with the guiding principles on businesses and human rights provided by, uh, by the United Nations. So let's look more into detail at what a substantial contribution to the transition to a circular economy means. Well, under Article 13, uh, an economic activity qualifies as substantially transitioning to a circular economy if we talk about one of these activities that are listed below. So we can see all the letters, just to name a few. It uses natural resources, including sustainable, uh, sustainably sourced bio-based or other raw materials. It prolongs the use of products. It prolongs the use of secondary raw materials. It increases the preparation for reuse and recycling of waste, uh, minimizing the waste uh, generation. So what does actually this article tells us? Uh, Substantial contribution is not easy to define, but in a circular economy, in a circular economy, in economic transition, a company that wants to actually substantially contribute 
to the transition to a circular economy, it has to carry out one of the, article, uh, of the activities that are listed in Article 13. So on the other hand, as we, see, as we said, we also have to make sure that it does also not significantly harm the circular economy. And what do we mean by that? As I said, Article 17 explain us a little bit uh, better. Well, it is not enough to safeguard the social uh, aspects or to contribute to the circular economy or to safeguard and comply with the technical um, screening. No, at the same time, we also need to avoid the negative outcomes that might come concomitantly to the good that we are making. So we need to ensure that these are the activities, while substantially contributing to the circular economy, do not significantly harm other aspects of the circular economy. So here we have a list with the, the examples. We need to ensure that these activities do not bring significant inefficiencies in the use of materials or that lead to an increase of the generation or um, incineration of waste or where the disposal of waste might cause significant harm to the environment. So, um, okay, so I think that in this small number of slides, I already shared a lot of information. And I think that in order to move on, we are required to understand how can we navigate throughout all these policies, legal acts, and information that the European Union or maybe other international commitments are providing us with. Uh, how do we work with all of this, especially um, from its legal perspective? Well, first of all, we can see, and also in my opinion, um, further legislative measures are needed. We need to ensure a harmonization. We need delegated acts, and even the taxonomy itself mentioned this, and we need legal certainty. Uh, moreover, we need to understand and identify the successful initiatives that are being are undertaken already by member states, because we do have uh, member states that are more virtuous than others, and use that information to set the basis uh, for new priorities towards the long-term objectives of the circular economy. And last but not least, we need to monitor those trends. The research is uh, in circular economy is progressing fast and much is still under development. Thus, we need to monitor what results we can, we can get with these measures already and understand how it develops over time. So with uh, specifically with regard to this, to the monitoring in, uh, of circular economy in 2018, the Commission launched um, communication on 10 circular economy indicators. Now in 2023, we talk about 11 indicators and I will briefly describe uh, those indicators. So, as you can see in this uh, beautifully displayed image that summarizes all those circular economy indicators, these indicators are, are divided by uh, groups, by thematic areas. Uh, here in the in this circle we have four, but now in 2023 this is the initial uh, communication. And now, of course, I have updated it. First of all, we have the group of production and consumption that covers raw materials, uh, self-sufficiency, GPP, waste generation, and food genera uh, food, uh, food waste that are, is uh, generated. Then we have the group of the waste management. And uh, these indicators focus on the recycling in general, but also on specific waste streams coming from uh, packaging, from electronics, or for example, from, from construction. Then we have uh, the group that is focused, uh, the thematic area uh, that covers competitiveness and innovation, which monitors private investments, patents, and also the employment rate of uh, people uh, in the circular economy sector. Then we have the secondary raw materials, which is monitoring uh, in terms of import and exports, the overall uh, material demand. 
But finally, we have a new indicator, which was not initially in, uh, in the communication of 2018. And this is the global sustainability and resilience. And this indicator, the 11th indicator, is focusing on the carbon footprint and uh, greenhouse gases emission and how much the European Union relies on imports and how much the European Union actually can and is able to contribute. So by just analyzing those thematic areas, we understand what is the European progress and maybe have also some hints of what happens globally when we move towards a circular economy and how or what can we achieve in, long, in terms of long-term objectives. Um, on the European Union website, there are specific sections of the Eurostat that are dedicated to a circular economy database, which provides uh, exact graphics and updated information on each of these indicators. Uh, however, there is one out of the 11 uh, uh, indicators that I just mentioned that is not developed yet. And uh, it might not come as a surprise, that is the one on green public procurement, actually. And the first results on green public procurement um, are expected in 2024, so starting from next year. In fact, this, um, this part on green public procurement and this issue is what connects us to, to the next topic and the second block of uh, my presentation, which is, of course, public procurement and why this is important in, in our research and discussion. So, um, first of all, for the novices in the matter, as I said uh, initially at the, initial, uh, at the beginning of this um, presentation, uh, public procurement is a process by which a government or a contracting authority buys work, products and services from private companies. And this is regulated by means of directives, uh, those of 2014, which are implemented by each member state. Here on the right side, um, hoping that you're not seeing mirrored um, the image, you can observe the general procurement circle starting uh, from the top, where the contracting authority is planning a tender, what actually they need, then all the phases of the procurement process, rules that can be found in the legislation of public uh, procurement, until the award of the contract and the contract management. For example, as many of, uh, of you in the audience are from Italy, in Italy, we talk about legislative decree uh, 36 of 2023, the one adopted in July this year. So public procurement represents a large share of the European gross domestic product, which means that the public authorities can use their purchase power to choose environmentally friendly goods that can be a driver for the circular economy and at the same time for, uh, to drive innovation. But as I said, uh, luckily, uh, the green public procurement indicator of a circular economy is still under development. So um, in this image, what do I, do I want to show you? Well, besides the fact that public procurement accounts to a high share of cross domestic product, this is not the only reason why we are discussing in relation with the circular economy. In fact, the public procurement is, in my opinion, a necessary tool to boost circular activities, considering that despite all the effort done by the European, uh, European Union, we saw the, the roadmap starting from 2010, uh, despite all this incredible work, uh, the most recent data shows that the progress uh, in terms of circular economy is plodding both globally and at the European level. So we have a circularity rate in Europe of 11%, which is still higher than the global one that is decreasing um, year by year to 7.6%. So now that we have the connection between the circular economy and the public procurement, there are many different levels or dimensions of the procurement where circularity can be embedded uh, and we can divide those into three different groups as uh, as explained also uh, by the 
commission through the procurement for circular economy uh, document. So first of all, we have the system level, meaning um, the overall dimension of the procurement, where we look at the overall structure of our of, of our need as a contracting authority. And we can choose instead of buying uh, to approach the product as a surface system or to allow cooperation with other organization or focus on sharing or the reuse of the products. Secondly, at the supply level, uh, there's also a way to intervene there. And in this case, a contracting authority can focus on what the company meaning the economic operator participating in the tender, participating to the procurement, can do in terms of circularity. For example, uh, design to disassemble the product, repair the product, taking it back after its use for five, 10 years, and so on. Finally, at the product level, there's also a way to intervene there because authorities can demand for products which um, contain circular elements from um, from the materials, uh, the, the way they are they are built, design, the possibility to be reused, their recyclability rate in terms of per percentages and so on. So um, let's see a little bit more into detail um, because there are some practical steps that can lead authorities or even uh, suppliers to to do more uh, by by just taking small steps in 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 towards a circular economic approach. First of all, uh, engaging with the market and exploring what are the solutions before uh, we as authorities uh, decide what we need, what we want to build, what we want to buy. Uh, we can explore the market and see if there are circular solutions that are already being offered. Because often the market is ahead of time and has the possibility or can innovate and create and give the tools and, of course, respond to all the public authorities' needs. Or they can work together towards a product that they don't know they need yet. Uh, next, another case, as I said before. In many cases, considering a service instead of buying the product is an opportunity. Therefore, the authority, in this case, uh, in, a, in a product as a service system, the authorities do not buy the product ownership, but only its functionality. For example, instead of buying uh, uh, printers for the offices, they can just rent them. Through, through this method. And this can happen also with other, other uh, appliances or computers, or uh, there is even the possibility to buy the light instead of the light bulbs. And of course, there are also many other cases. And finally, uh, the procurement can focus on the product uh, design by making product, by asking products that are easily can be um, uh, dissembled or reused or recycled, we can avoid, of course, uh, the impact that they have afterwards after being used and avoid waste, which is one of the main goal of the circular economy, and maintain their value on the market for as long as possible. So when preparing the tender documents and specifically uh, the technical specification and award criteria, uh, public authorities can embed circularity in many ways. Uh, so in terms of technical specifications, they can ask for eco-labels. Um, they can even ask for circular eco-labels because they do exist. For example, there is a label called Cradle to Cradle. They can include uh, GPP criteria. Those criteria are already applied on voluntary basis at the European level for different sectors and product categories. Um, and they are focusing on design, on waste prevention, and so on. And those GPP criteria, as I said, if you remember at the beginning of our presentation, um, are expected also to be um, part of uh, newly adopted sectoral legislation as uh, obligatory, as mandatory in the future. And finally, 
in terms of technical specifications, uh, when we talk about circularity, what is most important is that we need uh, the function of a product or we need to satisfy actually our needs. So what is uh, the best thing for the authority to, to do is that they need to identify whether the function or the performance-based technical specifications might be needed in order to achieve a circular result. And this is based on their needs. So uh, the moment previous to the tender, when authorities actually decide on what they want to embark on is the most important part of the procurement and uh, what they can achieve in terms of circularity. On the other hand, we have also the award phase. In this phase, um, the award phase uh, where authorities decide which supplier are they going to choose, are going to be awarded with the contract and they will uh, um, uh, stipulate the contract. In this phase, we can include uh, criteria that are based on quality and circularity aspects. And another very important point is the fact that we can use the life cycle costing method. And this method can encourage circularity because in uh, many cases, costs are linked to the use of a product, such as the energy consumption, services and maintenance costs. And disposal might be highly significant in terms of uh, price. So before concluding uh, my part of the presentation, I would like to showcase you an example of public procurement and circular economy that are being uh, linked together through a series of uh, pilot projects. Uh, this one, the, uh, the one that I took is a pilot case um, from the Interreg uh, North Sea region Cross-Circ. So you can find many others online. Uh, and is specifically a contract on the waste management services in the city of Malmo in Sweden. Uh, in this case, uh, the contract was focused on the collection of separated waste like cardboard, plastic, aluminum, and so on. The overall goal for this project and the procurement was to have an effective system of monitoring of the waste streams and work towards waste minimization and, of course, any other um, uh, negative environmental impact. Uh, these, uh, of course, if you are interested in finding many other pilot cases across Europe, for, exa for example, in Belgium, there is a, a complete circular building or in the Netherlands or in Denmark. Uh, those are available also through the link that I put below. Um, in this procurement, in this case, what could we find in terms of circularity and environmental uh, objectives? Well, first of all, um, in terms of transportation, the authority decided that um, uh, added value was given to those suppliers that uh, could live up to the climate reduction demands on transportation, resulting, of course, in CO2 emissions. So, for example, suppliers that had uh, vehicles running also on electricity, hydrogen gas, biogas, received a price reduction. Or, for example, in terms of containers used for, for the waste, suppliers that were, uh, were required to provide containers that were made from uh, the containers itself, they were made from recycled materials, promoting the use of sustainable resources. Uh, another example is the cleaning. Suppliers were also expected to clean the containers using only hot uh, water and avoiding the use of harm, uh, harmful chemicals that could, of course, have a negative impact on the environment. Uh, however, um, dealing with uh, procurement and also circularity or sustainability in general is not an easy task and they encounter also challenges. For example, in this case, finding a good pricing model that could satisfy all the environmental and circular criteria that um, they are, were focusing on was very difficult, yet it showcased, as a pilot case uh, itself says, of course, an opportunity to deliver uh, and work towards circularity. So um, to, to conclude uh, my presentation, 
I would like to recall some of the key takeaways. And the first one is that the transition to a circular economy is a key action of the European Union that can bring long-term competitiveness, uh, job creation, and put an end to resource scarcity and waste production. Secondly, the circular economy is a research field that is in constant development and its, uh, moni its monitoring is crucial. The circular economy indicators can help formulate priorities towards long-term objectives. And thirdly, public procurement can be a driver for the circular economy and for the innovation. It can boost the circular businesses, and we've seen uh, the taxonomy that leads us and showcases uh, through an exhaustive list how should they look like, and creates demand for circular work, supply, supplies, and products. So um, the closing question would be, is using European public procurement law a leverage for a circular economy a myth or a fact? Well, in my opinion, um, it's a fact. I would say that is a fact because public authorities can engage and they should, they must engage in public tenders with circular economy objectives and rethink to their needs into circular solution by introducing circularity in the tenders, for example, in the specification of, as we've seen, award criteria or contractual clauses. Uh, hope you could follow my presentation and I thank you very much. This is, uh, this is the end of my presentation, so I will stop also with, uh, with sharing the screen. Let's see if... Thank you, Aura. What's you thank you very me? much. Yes. Yes. Thank you. I, I would like to thank Aura uh, for our presentation. Uh, I believe you gave uh, a clear introduction to circular economy to all our students. Here we have uh, EEBL students as well as Erasmus students and students from other international programs offered by University of uh, Tor Vergata. So I believe uh, they have been able to appreciate your presentation. Um, I would like to just uh, give uh, the possibility to raise uh, a few questions uh, if they are or uh, maybe we can leave uh, um, a few minutes at the end of um, uh, Valentina presentation there is a, a, a hand but uh, we can just leave the floor first to Valentina and later we will have more questions thank you uh, thank you very much, Professor Raganelli, and thank you uh, to Aurat for setting uh, the ground so well for me and for introducing this very interesting subject about simple procurement and its linkages with the circular economy. Um, so Aurat's presentation and Aurat's research, of course, um, touched upon uh, uh, a dimension of sustainability, which is the environmental dimension of sustainability mainly, uh, in my case, uh, my research project is about sustainability at global level. So how uh, public procurement can actually uh, be a leverage for sustainable supply chain management in global supply chains. And uh, uh, of course, before I start, just a few words uh, about me. As you all know, I am a, a Sapiens uh, researcher. I am currently working at the University of Rome at Tor Vergata, where I'm also a PhD candidate in management. Uh, but before uh, uh, coming back to the academia, I would say in my case, I actually spend a lot of time working in developing countries and for uh, international organization where I could gather hands-on experience on the challenges of sustainability on the ground in uh, development and uh, developing and middle-income countries across sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, and also Middle East and North Africa. And this is in my professional experience and also my, my research interest uh, kind of merge on this topic about sustainable public procurement, because I always worked in public management, I always worked with governments, as I said, in developed and developing countries and uh, supported public administration reform and so on and so forth, and also public procurement. But 
uh, this topic, sustainable pipe procurement and global supply chain, really bridges what the um, public uh, sector and also the private sector actually can do if they um, build synergy, if they work together to achieve common goals, which are in this case the sustainable development goals and namely sustainable development goals uh, about responsible uh, production and consumption, which is goal number 12 and target 12.7, which is about sustainable procurement. So today I want to uh, introduce to you to this topic, first of all, talking about what are the sustainability issues in global supply chain to then see why we can use public procurement actually to contribute to address this issue. And finally, I will conclude by showing how public buyers can do it. Without further ado, um, let me introduce to you this subject, which I'm sure it's not new to a lot of you. Uh, we read in a lot of newspaper headlines uh, uh, in past years about scandals involving a very known brand uh, that were brought up by uh, issues in their supply chains. And these issues in their global supply chains are of various uh, aspects. They are of course issues that involve, uh, that are linked to the complexity of global supply chain and to the fact that it's very hard in this supply chain to uh, have visibility and traceability. So what, what happens in the global supply chain? Of course, it can happen also in short supply chain, but global supply chain are more exposed to this risk is that environmentally, global supply chain, of course, because of their configuration, because of the logistic, transportation, and so on and so forth, are uh, contribute to uh, global emissions. And actually, we know by uh, recent studies that scope three emissions, which are the supply chain emissions uh, called shortly, are actually the emissions uh, uh, that are uh, the form the majority of the uh, firm global emission. We also know that in global supply chain, since it's very hard to uh, trace back uh, to, to have traceability and also to have visibility, uh, we know that it's very hard uh, to know if uh, uh, at the very beginning of the supply chain where the raw materials are extracted actually, if that process is sustainable, is sustainable from uh, for the environment, but also sustainable for the workers, for the labor rights, for example. So we know that in a global supply chain, actually, not only uh, they can be uh, very presenting high risk uh, in terms of environmental degradation, but also in terms of social issues. Uh, we know that uh, they present uh, often human rights abuses that go unnoticed because of the um, problems of visibility. And uh, we know that uh, often there are poor working conditions in, in factories located very far away from where we buy the final product. And then we also know that there are health and safety issues. Everyone remembers the disaster in, uh, in the Rana Plaza um, in, in Bangladesh ten, 10 years ago and the loss of so many lives in, in Bangladesh for that. So we all know that uh, uh, global supply chain are more exposed to sustainability issues. But so why actually company involved in global supply chain? So companies are increasingly, would say, involved in global supply chains because of globalization, which is the increase uh, of, of trade and interconnectedness of the economy and society. And uh, why do firms uh, actually uh, do global sourcing, which uh, means purchasing uh, at global level? Because they want to benefit from lower cost of qualified and unqualified labor, lower cost of raw materials, tax benefits, favorable trade tariffs, access to new markets. And so what happened? It happens that the supply chains became longer and longer, and it happened that supply chain became more complex. You can see in this picture, there's 
uh, a graph of alternative production location in, in global supply chain where actually each component is located either domestic or internationally and you can see how this just you know exemplary graphic already uh, provides a very very complex network and uh, we can immediately understand why it's so hard to monitor uh, and enforce sustainability in global supply chains. But how do companies decide then to uh, to actually uh, ensure that their supply chains are more sustainable? via managing them, but managing them in a different way from how they used to manage supply chain before. Before, uh, companies would just focus on uh, uh, supply chain management for actually increasing uh, the overall supply chain economic performance and a single firm economic performance. Now we know, and from this defi popular definition from uh, Suring and Müller, uh, we know that uh, companies in increasingly involved on sustainable supply chain management, which means also that company coordinate the material and information and capital flows, as well as they cooperate among companies along the supply chain, while also taking other objectives, which are not economic objectives into account, and here, um, Turing and Müller refer to the three dimensions of sustainability, which are the economic, the environmental, and the social one. And they also point out that companies do so because of stakeholder requirements. And sustainable supply chain, what, what they mean for, for members of the supply chain, it means that actually they need to fulfill some sustainability criteria in order to remain within, within the supply chain. So it become a discriminatory factor. And so we, we can see what firms decided to do actually to ensure that uh, their supply chains and their global supply chains in particular are more sustainable. But what are the drivers that actually push firms to do so? Suring and Miller already told us that uh, stakeholder pressure are very important. And in fact, you can see in this, uh, in this graph, this, this is taken from an Ernest Young report uh, from last year, which is very interesting. I, I left you here the, the link uh, if you want to, uh, to look at it after. And they actually uh, did a survey of, of companies at global level and uh, they found out that uh, still the preliminary concern that push firms to push the sustainability in their supply chain management is cost savings. So, of course, the economic factor is always a push uh, for, for companies, a big push. But then it's very interesting also to notice that a second, uh, uh, the second position is occupied by compliance with regulatory requirements. And this should ring a bell to, to all of us because this means that firms are very sensitive to changes into the normative and regulation environment. And this means, for example, that what Aura told us before about the circular economy and how the EU, for example, is tackling this, um, trying to promote circular economy actually via taxonomy and via other directive. Uh, I think this shows that this is a very good and timely effort. And thirdly, uh, of course, this, this graph uh, uh, talks about external pressure. So firms really push the sustainability because investors, because suppliers, because consumers ask them to do so. And finally, very interestingly from this graph is that suppliers and firms actually um, push the sustainability also to improve internal uh, processes like uh, uh, they they use uh, uh, they push the sustainability also uh, in response from workforce and to actually increase the ethical responsibility. So it has become more and more important also to counter, for example, uh, staff loss and uh, increase staff retention also uh, to turn more sustainable for companies. And this is a change that we are increasingly seeing in the in the recent years. And 
we also know by by literature that actually there are some characteristics of the firm that makes the firm more sustainable, more actually more uh, likely to introduce sustainability in an effective way. And these characteristics, I listed them on the right side, are the, for example, the size of the firm, which matters. So firms who have more resources or invest more resources tend to have, of course, more sustainability and more uh, more uh, sustainable supply chain. At least they they invest more, so they normally are more sustainable than, for example, small and medium enterprises that really struggles to find the resources to embed sustainability into their production process or in their products and so on and so forth. Um, also firms that uh, uh, operate in sectors of high visibility have uh, higher chances to be more sustainable because uh, being further exposed and uh, more exposed to reputational risk is what makes also firms invest more in sustainability. So business to consumer rather than business to business uh, is a, a characteristic also that normally uh, makes firms uh, more likely to to adopt sustainability in their supply chain management. And thirdly, firms that have uh, uh, top management support that ensure that the leaders are committed to sustainability so that uh, the sustainability is not just a talk, but is actually ingrained and integrated into the company's vision in the values and in strategic decision making. And fourthly, uh, firms that invest in human capital. Uh, this is very important, and I will stress this uh, often in this presentation, that investment in trainings, in human capital is key, not only in the private sector, but also in the public sector, if we want really to uh, have organizations that take sustainability seriously. They need to really, when sustainability entails a change in the way we do things, in the way we produce things, in the way we buy. And so uh, it really uh, needs to be um, supported by training and by, by capacity building. And finally, firms that uh, do not act just as a controller, that do not just use the hard tools like audit, uh, like monitoring, uh, firms that also mixed these tools with relational tools such as suppliers development, such as cost sharing, and also partnership with uh, other actors, such as non-governmental organization, academia, or uh, companies, consulting companies, for example, that uh, conduct vendors rating or supplier ratings and help firms to monitor and enforce sustainability uh, in a more collaborative way into, into the supply chain. So finally, what do firms do actually to improve sustainability in their global supply chain? So we know what are the characteristics that actually makes firms more likely to um, adopt sustainability in their supply chain management, but what actually they do and they are doing. Here I'm showing you the graph uh, from uh, uh, an MIT report on the state of supply chain sustainability in, in 2023. The MIT has an observatory on uh, sustainable supply chain and they've been collecting data. Uh, over the last four years, so the, the of course uh, the the data, the longitudinal data are not from a long period, but still they they show uh, trends. And in this uh, in this graph, you can see uh, what do firms actually invest more on when they embed sustainability in their supply chain. And uh, there has been a boom, we can see from this graph, on code of conduct uh, for, for suppliers. So uh, this is a, a soft measure and uh, um, a soft measure, but uh, of course, of a um, control type uh, trying to enforce uh, uh, some standards, some values. And then we see, of course, there's supplier audit, uh, which is, uh, again, uh, control tools, supply chain mapping, which actually um, promote uh, the uh, gathering of knowledge about uh, the supply chain and the, and the lower tiers of the supply chain and also risk identification. 
And then we have kind of company from the from the focal company. We have standards and certification. We can see that there are various voluntary instruments that have been uh, um, implemented and used and uh, established in in recent years. We have collaboration with suppliers. Uh, visibility, so uh, improving uh, visibility in the in the supply chain via also information technologies, and then we have supplier benchmarking, environmental technologies, uh, also, and finally we really really conclude with the more relational tools like collaboration with uh, other parties like stakeholders and NGOs and supplier training and finally quite a new thing uh, carbon carbon offsets which is of course uh, ready for for special market and special and special goods of course as carbon uh, offsets measurement uh, is not uh, uh, yet uh, um, robust uh, and uh, does not have uh, very very uh, robust methodologies all across industries and sectors so we know uh, what firms do, and now we want I want to show you what actually governments are doing to uh, foster sustainability in supply chains and in global supply chains. There has been quite uh, a lot of action recently um, that, uh, of course, in Europe and in the US mainly, and in as you can see from this map from so-called Western countries where increasingly since uh, uh, 2015 onward uh, there has been a, a concern on on how to actually um, enforce due diligence and mandate due diligence in global supply chain so all these uh, new uh, laws actually tackle sometimes a very specific part of sustainability of supply chain, like the child labor law in the Netherlands, or the uh, we have the um, Mother Slavery Act in the UK. And sometimes they are more all across, like the most recent European Union due diligence, corporate sustainability due diligence right directive that is under discussion and uh, will uh, apply will be applied actually to uh, large companies operating in the uh, in European Union or that are European and that ask these large companies to actually uh, make uh, due diligence and report on due diligence identified risks in their supply chain. So we can see that countries are complementing the voluntary instruments that uh, were already out there, like guidelines, like standards and certification, with more binding instruments, uh, such as uh, uh, supply chain due diligence uh, regulation. And so countries are not only actually um, uh, issuing new rules and uh, regulation, they are also uh, more and more investing on sustainable power procurement. This is certainly true for the European Union. And why can we use public procurement to make global supply chains more sustainable? This is the core uh, part of, of my presentation, actually. We can use public procurement uh, for, for various reasons, uh, which I divide into economic and non-economic reasons. The economic reasons are quite known. So we know that public procurement represents 13.3% 13, uh, of GDP in the EU and 20 for, to 45% of OECD countries' expenditures. This means that sustainable the public procurement expenditure volume actually can be used to uh, turn public procurement not only uh, into from a process basically into a policy tool so that it is able to orient the market because of the volume of public expenditure and we know that uh, out of the EU, actually, these numbers can be even higher. Like in developing countries, uh, the, the share of uh, GDP that uh, is attached to public procurement can also be, be higher than that. And moreover, we know that uh, state-owned enterprises play uh, a key role in global value chains. Uh, uh, recently, the IMF said that actually 
state-owned enterprises are growing in numbers. And we see that this is particularly true also for the relevance in emerging countries like, uh, like China. And we know that countries like China, for example, have committed to uh, net zero and that they actually asked state-owned enterprise to lead by example and uh, and start uh, actually um, reducing their, their carbon emissions. Uh, so via their, their public procurement, public organization can A, orient the market, B, lead by example. And there are also non-economic reasons. Uh, so public organization, of course, uh, have different goals rather than private sector organization. They have the duty to act to the benefit of public interest. And we also are assisting to a shift in terms of objectives. Uh, so normally we call the economic objective the primary objectives or the traditional objectives and sustainability as often being considered a secondary objectives. But this is not the case anymore. And more and more sustainability is becoming as important as financial and economic objectives for countries and for organizations as well. And finally, we should use public procurement to make global supply chain more sustainable because public sector supply chain are not different from private sector supply chains and they are not immune from risks that are related to sustainability. In fact, here I wanted to, to show you that actually a large share of goods and services that are bought by the governments is linked to global supply chains. Here I'm showing you the data taken from this very interesting um, publication, this paper that uh, talks about the role of government as a buyer to actually foster sustainability in uh, at global level. And they took uh, data and uh, I have to stress that actually we really lack data. Sorry, I can hear an echo. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I can still hear my voice. Uh, someone, the micro, does someone has the microphone on? Sorry. Sorry, Valentina, there is uh, something not working. No problem. Okay. Okay. No. no, yes, I can still hear the, the echo. I think just to mute all the mic and uh, should work. We can hear you now. Now it's fine. Okay. Thank you very much. So uh, I was saying that here they actually report uh, about data, about uh, EU tenders and international public procurement data. And they show that actually the share of international public procurement in the EU that actually goes to multinational, 54%, and to domestic firms, but actually uh, domestic firm which share is actually for 36% um, belongs to foreign value added, meaning that 36% of that actually is captured by global supply chains. So we know that actually uh, it's not a very far away issue, this one of the global supply chain from the public sector, because a lot of goods that the public administration buys actually are embedded in global supply chains. So what is the nexus between public procurement and sustainability in global supply chains? So the the assumption is that public administration via implementing sustainable public procurement in a certain way, actually, they can require suppliers to channel down their uh, multi-tier supply chains that scatter different countries and is geographically diffuse. They can then channel down the criteria, the sustainability criteria along their supply chain via sustainable supply chain management. And what are the expected results of this is that suppliers adopt sustainable practices that are required by the public buyers. And this in turn makes the environmental, economic and social performance of both the supply and the public administration increasing. So it actually could be a win-win situation. But what's the reality? 
the reality is that public buyers actually really adopt a supply chain perspective when they implement sustainable procurement. Here I um, I copied an extract uh, from a UNEP uh, recent report on SDG 12.7 on the sustainable procurement goal, where they actually find out that uh, uh, from all the countries they surveyed, only 18% of respondents actually are doing an assessment of risks in the supply chain and of impacts that are induced by public the procurement of specific uh, types of products before the development of sustainable procurement criteria. So actually by this, we know that public buyers, actually they implement sustainable buyer procurement without knowing um, their supply chains without knowing the risks their supply chains are exposed to. And this is uh, particularly challenging, not only uh, if we want to prevent uh, uh, issues uh, in, in contract management or in, in public purchases, but also because this affects actually the output, uh, the intended output of sustainable power procurement implementation. So it could actually jeopardize the sustainability results that we intend to make via making that purchase. So how to actually adopt a supply chain perspective then in sustainable power procurement? Well, actually it's not that difficult. Uh, public buyers should definitely invest and spend more time in the preparatory stage of the procurement cycle and they should conduct a very thorough market analysis and a mapping of the supply chain vulnerability and sustainability risk because we are often and increasingly exposed not only to sustainability risk but also to risk related to resilience. We know that uh, supply chains are increasingly um, in the, at the center of the attention for disruption, for example, that have been caused during the COVID-19 pandemic. So actually knowing the supply chains not only allows public buyers to know more about uh, their sustainability goals, but they also uh, th that would also allow them to actually uh, push more resilience and increase resilience. And then uh, they, um, they should make a risk management plan and update it regularly. So in, in building really a risk management process around sustainability in public procurement is, is key and is something that, as we just learned, is not very often done. And then they can introduce sustainability criteria and vulnerability consideration that are informed by the supply uh, chain risk analysis. Finally, they can measure, monitor and evaluate the performance of the suppliers and they can also enhance visibility and transparency of the supply chain by using digital tools and continuous organizational learning processes. So it looks like the tools are there, but we actually, uh, public buyer actually do not uh, do not often um, do not often uh, use these tools. So I, I've been asked to wrap up a little bit my, my presentation. So I will just uh, quickly uh, finish it. I have just uh, uh, two, two slides left. Here I wanted to show you the, the differences uh, between the public sector and the private sector, because often uh, we think that uh, the public sector cannot really or does not have the same tools as the private sector, which is true, of course, does not have the same true, but that doesn't mean that they cannot uh, apply a supply chain perspective in uh, public procurement or in sustainable procurement. So here you can see the main difference. We have a compliance based supply chain governance from public buyer perspective, whereas in private private firms is more risk informed and resources and control based. In public uh, sector, we have a regulation about global uh, about green public procurement and sustainable procurement that give public uh, sector a uh, very um, large power in influencing the market. And in the private sector, we have procurement guidelines and code of conduct and more voluntary instruments. And we can have uh, mandatory supply chain due diligence and monitoring and we saw that recently countries are investing more and more on that and in private firms we have definitely the due diligence the supply chain risk assessment and monitoring 
and so on and so forth. So I will leave this slide to you to read more about uh, the slight difference. But the key takeaway of this is that actually the public sector can really, really uh, adopt a supply chain perspective in uh, sustainable pipe procurement and in public procurement in general. And it can, the public sector can do so by embedding sustainability in the tender design phase and also in the contract design phase. And here I'm stressing the importance of really, really uh, spending time in the preparatory phase. So in the market analysis, in the risk mapping for the purchase and in balancing the different sustainability dimension and residency consideration against identified objectives, because we know that sustainability is a multidimensional concept and it's very, very hard sometimes to balance the three dimension and there are trade-offs that are caused by that. And I want also to stress that focusing on the tender design is not enough. There are also contract design um, um, tools that we can use, uh, contract clauses that include, for example, mechanisms for monitoring and verifying the supplier's performance, including the measurement of suppliers beyond the first year. We can uh, also include contract management to ensure that uh, suppliers' capacities are taken into account and prompt communication of risk is also covered. So there are various tools that public buyer has, just they need to know what its tools are and they need to be trained on how to use them properly. So I would like to conclude with the two key takeaways for you. So first of all, uh, it's true that public buyers can really make their supply chain more sustainable via sustainable procurement. And secondly, I would say that the first step to do so for public buyers is really to increase their knowledge of their supply chains and look beyond their direct suppliers. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm leaving here my contact details. If any of you is interested in this topic and would like to reach out after this presentation to me, I would be very happy uh, to, to be in touch with you all.